Hello, my name is Sam, and I will be reading a book that I have enjoyed very much so that other people like you who's listening could benefit from the book I've read. The first ever book I'm going to post on YouTube is a book called Show Your Work by Austin Kleon, and the subtitle is 10 Ways to Share Your Creativity and Get Discovered. So in the beginning, there's a quote that goes like this. For artists, the great problem to solve is how to get oneself noticed by Honoré de Balzac. So this is the introduction, a new way of operating. When I have the privilege of talking to my readers, the most common question they ask me are about self-promotion. How do I get my stuff out there? How do I get noticed? How do I find an audience? How did you do it? I hate talking about self-promotion. Comedian Steve, uh, Steve Martin famously dodges these questions with the advice, be so good they can't ignore you. If you just focus on getting really good, Martin says, people will come to you. I happen to agree. You don't really find an audience for your work. They find you. But it's not enough to be good. Uh, in order to be found, you have to be findable. I think there's an easy way of putting your work out there and making it discoverable while you're focused on getting really good at what you do. Now, this first uh, paragraph of the introduction really caught my attention because, you know, like, honestly, I hate self-promoting or I really respect the people who are in sales because that's not something that I've, that I've been trained or that I'm uncomfortable with. But the idea of here, uh, this book where you have to be findable and in order to be findable, you have to, you have to be really good at something, uh, whether that's uh, in speaking or that's whether writing codes or uh, designing or teaching or, you know, running a business. And I think uh, this book will show how you will be findable or discoverable so that you can connect with other people, you can have new ideas, you, you can even come up with a new project with somebody. Let me continue reading. By generously sharing their ideas and their knowledge, they often gain an audience that they can then leverage when they need it for fellowship, feedback, or patronage. I wanted to create a kind of beginner's manual for this way of operating. So here's what I came up with. A book for people who hate the very idea of self-promotion. Uh, that's me. And I think this line right here is just the basic premise or the thesis of this book. An alternative, if you will, to, to self-promotion. I'm going to try to teach you how to think about your work as a never-ending process, how to share your process in a way that attracts people who might be interested in what you do, and how to deal with the ups and downs of putting yourself and your work out into the world. Imagine if your next boss didn't have to read your resume because he already reads your blog. Imagine uh, being a student and getting your first gig based on a school project you posted online. Imagine losing your job but having a social network of people familiar with your work and ready to help you find a new one. Imagine turning a side project or a hobby into your profession because you had a following that could support you. Or imagine something simpler and just as satisfying, spending the majority of your time, energy, and attention practicing a craft, learning a trade, or running a business, while also allowing for the possibility that your work might attract a group of people who share your interest. All you have to do is show your work. And this is what this book is about. Like, how can you show your work to the world so that you are, again, findable or discoverable? And this is a very short book, uh, and a small book so if you pick it up and there's lots of visualizations that the author does and it's really in short paragraphs and it's really easy to follow so I'll strongly recommend for you to get it chapter one you don't have to be a genius and it starts with a quote find a genius uh, give what you have to someone it may be better than you dare think by Henry Longfellow. 
There are lots of destructive myths about creativity, but one of the most dangerous is the lone genius myth. An individual with superhuman talents appears out of nowhere at certain points in history, free of influences or precedent with a direct connection to God or the muse. When inspiration comes, it strikes like a lightning bolt. A light bulb switches on his head and then he spends the rest of his time toiling away in his studio, shaping this idea into a finished masterpiece that he releases into the world to great fanfare. If you believe in the long genius myth, or sorry, if you believe in the lone genius myth, creativity is an antisocial act performed by only a few great figures, mostly dead men with names like Mozart, Einstein, or Picasso. The rest of us are left to stand around and gawk in awe at their achievements. There's a healthier way of thinking about creativity that musician Brian Eno refers to as seniors. Under this model, Great ideas are often birthed by a group of creative individuals, artists, curators, thinkers, theorists, and other uh, test makers who make up an ecology of talent. If you look back closely at art, art, at history, many of the people who we think of alone geniuses were actually part of a whole scene of people who were supporting each other, looking at each other's work, copying from each other, stealing ideas and contributing ideas. Seniors doesn't take away from the achievements of those great individuals. It just acknowledges that good work isn't created in a vacuum and that creativity is always, in some sense, a collaboration that result of a mind, the result of a mind connected to other minds. And I think the, the word collaboration is the key where uh, by sharing or by showing your work, uh, you get to uh, build more uh, of that. To continue reading. What I love about the idea of seniors is that it makes room in the story of creativity for the rest of us, the people who don't consider ourselves geniuses. Being a valuable part of a seniors is not necessarily about how smart or talented you are, but about what you have to contribute the ideas you share, the quality of the connections you make, and the conversations you start. If we forget about genius and think more about how we can nurture and contribute to a seniors, we can adjust our own expectations and the expectations of what uh, of the worlds uh, we want to accept us. We can stop asking what others can do for us and start asking what we can do for others. We live in an age where it's easier than ever to join a seniors. The internet is basically a bunch of seniors connected together, divorced from physical geography. Blogs, social media sites, email groups, discussion boards, forums, they're all the same thing. Virtual scenes where people go to hang out and talk about the things they care about. There's no bouncer, no gatekeeper, and no barrier to enter entering these scenes. You don't have to be rich. You, you don't have to be famous. You don't have to have a fancy resume or a degree from an expensive school. Online, everyone, the artist and the curator, the master and the apprentice, the expert and the amateur, has the ability to contribute something. And I think this paragraph just grasps the idea of what the internet is. Is. And it's a very uh, strong statement. And it, uh, for me as a teacher, it makes me rethink uh, what needs to happen in school uh, or how can we utilize the internet to become better learners or better uh, knowledge workers in the future. We're all terrified of being revealed as amateurs. But in fact, today it is the amateur, the enthusiast who pursues her work in the spirit of love. In French, the word means lover. Regardless of the potential for fame, money, or career, who often has the advantage over the professional? Because they have little to lose, amateurs are willing to try anything and share the results. They take chances, experiment, and follow their whims. Sometimes, in the process of doing things in an unprofessional way, they make new discoveries. In the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities, said Zen monk uh, Shunryu Suzuki. In the expert's mind, there are few. 
Amateurs are not afraid to make mistakes or look ridiculous in public. They're in love, so they don't hesitate to do work that others think of as silly or just plain stupid. The real gap between doing nothing and doing something. Amateurs know that contributing something is better than contributing nothing. Amateurs might lack formal training, but they're all lifelong learners and they make a point of learning in the open so that others can learn from their failures and successes, writer David Foster said. Amateurs fit the same bill. They're just regular people who get obsessed by something and spend a ton of time thinking out loud about it. Just a quick question to the listeners. What are you thinking out loud? Continuing, the world is changing at such a rapid rate that it's turning us all into amateurs. Even for professionals, the best way to flourish is to retain an amateur spirit and embrace uncertainty and the unknown. When Radiohead frontman uh, Tom York was asked what he thought his greatest strength was, he answered that I don't know what I'm doing. Like one of his heroes, Tom Waits, whenever you York feels like his songwriting is getting too comfortable or stale, he'll pick up an instrument he doesn't know how to play and try to write with it. This is yet another trait of amateurs. They'll use whatever tools they get their hands on to try their ideas uh, into the world. The best way to get started on the path to sharing your work is to think about what you want to learn and make a commitment to learning it in front of others. Find a genius, pay attention to what, what others are sharing, and then start taking note of what they're not sharing. Be on the lookout for voids that you can fill with your own efforts. No matter how bad they are at first, don't worry for now about how you'll make money or a career out of it. Forget about being an expert or a professional and wear your amateurism, your heart, your love, on your sleeves. Share what you love and the people who love the same things will find you. I think this is so true because right now, uh, you know, I'm, I started as a YouTuber last October. Uh, I don't even have 100 followers, but I just love uh, reading and learning. So I just want to share that uh, through this uh, booktube, my channel. Uh, and I hope that I'll uh, encounter people who love the same books or love the same topics as I do. You can't find your voice if you don't use it. We're always being told, find your voice. When I was younger, I never really knew what this meant. I used to worry a lot about voice, wondering if I had my own. But now I realize that the only way to find your voice is to use it. It's hardwired, built into you. Talk about the things you love. Your voice will follow. It sounds a little extreme, but in this day and age, if your work isn't online, it doesn't exist. We all have the opportunity to use our voices, to have our say, but so many of us are wasting it. If you want people to know about you, what you do, and the things you care about, you have to share. Uh, chapter 2. Uh, think process, not product. Take people behind the scenes. When a painter talks about her work, she could be talking about two different things. There's an artwork, she finished the finished piece, framed and hung on a gallery wall. And then there's the art space work, all the day-to-day -day stuff that goes behind the scenes in her studio. Looking for inspiration, getting an idea, applying all to a canvas, etc. There's painting, the noun, and there's painting, the verb. As, it, as in all kinds of work, there's a distinction between the painter's process and the products of her process. Today, by taking advantage of the internet and social media, an artist can share whatever she wants, whenever she wants, at almost no cost. She can decide exactly how much or how little of her work and herself will be will share and she can be as open about her process as she wants to. She can share her sketches and her works in progress, post pictures of her studio or blog about her influence, inspiration and tools. By sharing her day-to-day -day process, the things she really cares about, she can form a unique bond with her audience. 
To many artists, particularly those who grew up in the pre-digital era, this kind of openness and the potential vulnerability that goes along with sharing one's process is a terrifying idea. But human beings are interested in other human beings and what other be human beings do. People really do want to see the sausage, how the sausage gets made. That's how the designers Dan Provost and Term Gerthard put in their book, uh, Entrepreneurship, it will be exhilarating. By putting things out there consistently, you can form a relationship with your customers. It allows them to see the person behind the products. Audiences not only want to stumble across great work, but they too long to be creative and part of the creative process. By letting go of your egos and sharing your process, we allow for the possibility of people having an ongoing connection with us and our work, which helps us to move our move more of our product. Become a documentarian of what you do. Uh, in 2013, the internet fell in love with the astronaut Chris Hadfield, commander of the International Space Station. Three years later, Hadfield and his family were sitting around the dinner table trying to figure out ways to generate interest for the Canadian Space Agency, which, like many space programs, faced major uh, budget cuts and needed more public support. That wanted a way to help people connect with the real side of what an astronaut's life is, said Hadfield's son, Evan. Not just the glamour and the science, but also the day-to-day -day activities. Commander Hadfield wanted to show his work. Things fell in place when his sons explained social media to him and got him to set up a Twitter and other social networks. During his next five-month mission, while performing all his regular astronautical duties, he tweeted, answered questions from his followers, posted pictures he'd, he'd taken, from, taken of Earth, recorded music, and filmed YouTube videos of himself clipping his nails, brushing his teeth, sleeping, and even performing maintenance on the space station. Millions of people ate it all up, including my agent Ted, who tweeted, wouldn't normally watch live video of a, a couple of guys doing plumbing repair, but it's in space. Now let's face it, we're not all artists or astronauts. A lot of us go about our work and feel like we have nothing to show for it at the end of the day. But whatever the nature of your work, there's an art to what you do. And there are people who will be interested in that art only if you presented it to them in the right way. In fact, sharing your process might actually be most valuable if the products of your own work aren't easily shared. If you're still in the apprentice stage of your work, if you can't get just to slap up a portfolio and call it a day, or if your process doesn't necessarily lead to tangible finished products, you have to turn the invisible into something other people can see. You have to make stuff, said journalist David Carr when he, uh, when he was asked if he had only and any advice for students. No one is going to give a damn about your resume. They want to see what you have made with your little fingers. So become a documentarian of what you do. Start a work journal. Write your thoughts down in a notebook or speak them into an audio recorder. Keep a scrapbook. Take a lot of photographs of your work at different stages in your process. Shoot video of your working. This isn't about making art. It's about simply keeping track of what's going on around you. Take advantage of all the cheap, easy tools at your disposal. These days, most of us carry a fully functional multimedia studio around in our smartphones. Whether you share it or not, documenting and recording your process as you go along has its own rewards. You'll start to see the work you're doing more clearly and feel like you're making progress. And when, when you're ready to share, you'll have a surplus of material to choose from. Chapter 3. Share something small every day. Overnight success is a myth. Dig into almost every overnight success story and you'll find about a decade's worth of hard work and perseverance. Building a substantial body of work takes a long time, a lifetime, a really, but thankfully, you don't, have, you don't need that time all in one big chunk. So forget about decades, forget about years, forget about months. Focus on days. The day is the only unit of time that I can really get my head around. Seasons change. Weeks are completely human made. Uh, but the day has a rhythm. The sun goes up. The sun goes down. I can handle that. Once a day after you've worked done, after you've done your work's day, 
go back to your documentation and find one little piece of your process that you can share. Uh, where you are in your process will determine what the piece is. If you're in the very early stages, share your influences and one, what's inspiring you. If you're in the middle of ex executing a project, write about your methods or share your works in progress. If you've just completed a project, show the final product, share scraps from the cutting room floor or write about what you've learned. If you have lots of projects all out into the world, you can report on how they're doing. You can tell stories about how people are interacting with your work. A daily dispatch is even better than a resume or a portfolio because it shows what we're working on right now. When the artist Z Frank was interviewing job candidates, he complained. When I asked them to show me work, they would show me things from school or from another job, but I'm more interested in what they did last weekend. The form of what you share doesn't matter. Your daily dispatch can be anything you want. A blog post, an email, a tweet, a YouTube video, or some other little bit of media. There's no one-size-fits-all plan for everybody. Social media sites are perfect place to share daily updates. Don't worry about being on every platform. Pick and choose based on what you do and people you're trying to reach. Filmmakers hang around on YouTube or Vimeo. Business people, for, for some strange reason, love LinkedIn. Writers love Twitter. Visual artists tend to like Tumblr, Instagram, or Facebook. The landscape is constantly changing. The new platforms are always popping up and disappearing. Don't be afraid to be an early adopter. Jump on a new platform and see if there is something interesting you can do with it. If you can't find a good use for a platform, feel free to abandon it. Use your creativity. Film critic Tommy, Tommy Edison, who has been blind since birth, takes photos of his day-to-day -day life and posts them to Instagram under at blind film critic he's followed by more than 30 a thousand people uh, don't say you don't have enough time we're all busy but we all get 24 hours a day people often ask me how do you find the time to do all this and i answer i look for it you find time uh, the same place you find uh, spare change in the nukes and crannies. You find it in the cracks between big stuff, your commute, your lunch break, the few hours after your kids go to bed. You have to miss an episode of your favorite TV show. You might have to miss an hour of sleep, You can find, but you can find the time if you look for it. I like to look for... Uh, I like to look work while the world is, world is sleeping and share while the world is at work. Always remember that anything you post on the internet has now become public. The internet is a copy machine, writes author Kevin Kelly. Once anything that can be copied is brought into contact with the internet, it will be copied and those copies never leave. Ideally, you want the work you post online to be copied and spread to every corner of the internet. So don't post things online that you're not ready for everyone in the world to see. As publicist Lauren Saren said, post as though everyone who can read it has a power to fire you. Uh, and then the author suggests that uh, build a good domain name. Uh, social networks are great, but they come and go. Uh, remember MySpace, Friendster, GeoCities? If you're really interested in sharing your work and expressing yourself, nothing beats owning your own space online, a place that you control, a place that no one can take away from you, a world headquarters where people can always find you. More than 10 years ago, I asked my, I staked my own little internet claim and bought the domain name austinclan.com. I was completely um, amateur with no skills when I began building my website. It started off bare bones and ugly. Eventually, I figured out how to install a blog that changed everything. A blog is an ideal machine for turning flow into stock. One little blog post is nothing on its own, but publish a thousand blog posts blog post over a decade and it turns into your life's work. My blog has been my sketchbook, my studio, my gallery, my storefront, and my salon. Absolutely everything good that has happened in my career can be tra traced back to my blog. My books, my art shows, my speaking gigs, some of my best friendships, they all exist because I have my own little space, a piece of turf on the internet. So, if you get one thing out of this book, make it this. Go register a domain name. And this is what I did a couple of months ago. And uh, unfortunately, 
Uh, it's still in the building phase, so I probably have only like two articles on it. Uh, hopefully, I'll launch this uh, during summer so that people can start finding me in my own website, not through uh, my digital or SNS platform. Continuing, don't think of your website as a self-promotion machine. Think of it as a self-invention machine. Online, you can become the person you really want to be. Fill your website with your work and your ideas and the stuff you care about. Over the years, you will be tempted to abandon it for a newest, shiniest social network. Don't give in. Don't let it fall into neglect. Think about it in the long term. Stick with it, maintain it, and let it change with you over time. The beauty of owning your own turf is that you can do whatever you want with it. Your domain name is your domain. You don't have to make compromises, build a good domain name and keep it clean and eventually it'll become its own currency. Whether people show up or they don't, you, you're you out there doing your thing, ready whenever they are. Chapter 4. Open up your cabinet of curiosities. Don't be a hoarder. If you happen to be wealthy and educated and alive in 16th and 17th century Europe, it was fashionable to have a wonder cavern a wonder chamber or a cabinet of curiosities in your own house a room filled with rare and remarkable objects that served as a kind of external display or your thirst for knowledge of the world inside a cabinet of curiosities you find books skeletons jewels uh, shells arts plants minerals taxidermy uh, specimens stones or any other exotic artifact these collections are often juxtaposed both natural and human made uh, marvels revealing a kind of mashup of handiwork by both god and human beings they were the precursors of what they think of today as a modern museum a place dedicated to the study of history nature and the arts we all have our own treasured collections they can be physical cabinets of curiosity say living room bookshelves full of favorite novels records and movies or they can be more like intangible museums of the heart our skulls lined with our memories of places we've been people we've met experiences we've accumulated we all carry around the weird and wonderful things uh, we've come across while doing our work and living our lives these mental scrapbooks form our taste and our taste influence our work well, where do you get your inspiration? What sorts of things do you fill your head with? What do you read? Do you su subscribe to anything? What sites do you visit on the internet? What music do you listen to? What movies do you see? Do you look at art? Do you look, what do you collect? What's inside your scrapbook? What do you pin to the corkboard above your desk? What do you stick on your refrigerator? Who's done the, uh, the work that you admire? Who do you steal ideas from? Do you have any heroes? Who do you follow online? Who are the practitioners you look up to in your field? Your influences are all worth sharing because they clue uh, people in into who you are and who what you do, sometimes even more than your own work. When you share your taste and influences, have the guts to own all of it. Don't give in to the pressure of self-edit too much. Don't be the lame guys at the record store arguing over who's more authentic punk rock band. Don't try to be hip or cool. Be open and honest about what you like is the best way to connect with people who like those things too. Uh, credit is always due. If you share the work of others, it's your duty to make sure the creators of that work get proper credit. Crediting work in our copy and paste age of reblogs and retweets can seem like a futile effort, but it's worth it and it's right and it's the right thing to do. You should always share the work of others as if it were your own, treating it with respect and care. Chapter 5. Telling Good Stories Work doesn't speak for itself. So he's uh, giving you an example, so uh, short exercise so close your eyes and imagine you're a wealthy collector who's just entered a gallery in an art museum on the wall facing there are two gigantic canvases each more than 10 feet tall both paintings depict a harbor at sunset from across the room they look identical the same ships the same reflections on the water the same sun at the same stage of setting you go in for a closer look you can't find a label or a museum tag anywhere you become obsessed with the paintings which nickname painting a and painting b 
You spend an hour going back and forth from it, uh, canvas to canvas, comparing brush strokes. You can't detect a single difference. Just as you go to fetch a museum guard or someone who can shed light on these mysterious twin masterpieces, the head creator of the museum walks in. You eagerly inquire as to the origins of your new obsessions. The creator tells you that painting A was uh, painted in the 17th century by a Dutch master. And what about what of painting B, you ask? Ah, uh, yes, painting B, the creator says. That's a forgery. It was copied last week by a graduate student at the local art college. Look up the paintings. Which canvas looks better now? Which one do you want to take home? Art forgery is a strange phenomenon. You might think that the pleasure you get from painting depends on its color and its shape and its pattern, says psychology professor Paul Bloom. And if that's right, it shouldn't matter whether it's an original or a forgery. But our brains don't work that way. When shown an object or given a food or shown a face, people's assessment of it, how much they like it, how valuable it is, is deeply affected by what you tell them about it. Stories are such a powerful driver of emotional value that their effect on any given object's subjective value can actually be measured objectively. So words matter. So your work doesn't exist in a vacuum. Whether you realize it or not, you're already telling a story about your work. Every email you send, every text, every conversation, every blog comment, every tweet, every photo, every video, they're all bits and pieces of multimedia narrative uh, you're constantly constructing. If you want to become more effective when sharing yourself and your work, you need to become a better storyteller. You need to know what a good story is and how to tell one. And I think this is uh, so true that knowing how to tell stories, uh, it's a very good skill or a very essential skill that you need to have. Uh, he gives an example of most story structures can be traced back to the myths and fairy tales. Emma Coates, uh, a former storyboard artist at Pixar, outlined the basic structure of a fairy tale as a kind of mad lib that you can fill in with your own elements. Once upon a time, there was blank. Every day, blank. One day, blank. Because of that, blank. Because of that, blank. Until finally, blank. Pick your favorite story and try to fill in the blanks. It's striking how often it works. So every client presentation, every personal essay, Every cover letter, every fundraising request, they're all pitches. There are stories with the endings chopped off. A good pitch is set up in three acts. The first act is the past. The second act is the present. And the third act is the future. The first act is where you've been, what you want, how you came to want it, and what you've done so far to get it. The second act is where you are now in your work and how you've worked hard and used up most of your resources. The third act is where you're going and how exactly the person you're pitching can help you get there. Like a choose your own adventure book, this story shape effectively turns into your listeners into the hero who gets, who gets to decide how it ends. Everybody loves a good story, but a good storytelling doesn't come easy to everybody. It's a skill that takes a lifetime to master. So study great stories and then go find some of your own. Your stories will get better better the more you tell them and i think i'm just uh you know reading through uh paragraphs that i think is important reading out loud good stories is also going to help you to become a better storyteller uh, chapter six teach what you know share your trade secrets So he tells a story about um, a barbecue. So the world of barbecue is notoriously secretive and competitive. So it was a little bit of a shock last winter for me to be standing behind the legendary Franklin barbecue here in Austin, Texas, watching pitmaster and barbecue wizard Aaron Franklin 
explained how he smokes his famous ribs in front of a camera crew. My friend Sarah Robertson, a producer at the local PBS station, uh, KL, KLRU, had invited me to watch a taping of a BBQ with Franklin, a crowdfunded YouTube series designed to take viewers through step-by-step -step of the barbecue process. In the series, Franklin explains how to modify... Uh, an off-the-shelf smoker, how to select the right wood, how to build a fire, how to select the cut of meat, what temperature to smoke uh, the meat at, and how to slice up the finished product. Um, and then when I walked into, when I got to talk to Aaron and his wife, Stacy, during the break in filming, they explained that the technique of the barbecue is actually very simple, but it takes years and years to master there's an intuition that you only gain through repetition of practice. And I think this is crucial, right? So whatever skill you're trying to pick up, it might look easy at first, but just know that you need perseverance because you need to um, have a lot of, lot of practice to master even maybe the most simplest skill. And for me, uh, that's YouTube. It looks simple, but... Uh, for those who have started your own channel, it's not easy uh, doing on a constant uh, basis. So think about what you can share from your process that would inform the people you're trying to reach. Have you learned a craft? What are your techniques? Are you skilled at using certain tools and materials? What kind of knowledge comes along with your job? The minute you learn something, turn around and teach it to others. Share your reading list, point to helpful references, materials, create some tutorials and post them online. Use pictures, words, and video. Uh, take people step by step through part of your process. As blogger Kathy Sierra says, make people better at something they want to be better at. Teaching people doesn't subtract value from what you do. It actually adds to it. When you teach someone how to do your work, uh, you are in effect generating more interest in your work. People feel closer to your uh, work because you're letting them in on what you know. Best of all, when you share knowledge and your work with others, you receive an education in return. Author Christopher Hitchens said that the great thing about putting out a book is that it brings you into contact with people whose opinions you should have a car canvas before you ever pressed pen to paper. They write to you, they telephone you, they come to your bookstore events and give you things to read that you should have already read. He said that having his work out in the world was a free education that goes for a lifetime. Chapter 7. Don't turn into a human spam. Shut up and listen. Uh, when I was in college, there was always one classmate in every creative writing workshop who claimed, I love to write, but I don't like to read. It was evident right away that you could uh, pretty much write that kid off completely. As every writer knows, if you want to be a writer, you have to be a reader first. Uh, the writing community is full of lame old people uh, who want to be published in journals even though they don't read the magazines that they want to be published in, says writer Dan uh, Chaon. So these people deserve the rejections that they will undoubtedly receive and no one should feel sorry for them when they cry about how they can't get anyone to accept their stories. I call these people human spam. Of course you don't have to be a you don't have to be a nobody to be a human spam. I've watched plenty of interesting successful people uh, slowly turn into it. The world becomes all about them and their work. They can't find the time to be interested in anything other than themselves. If you want fans, uh, you have to be a fan first. If you want to be accepted by a community, you have to be a first, uh, be a good citizen of that community. If you're only pointing to your own stuff online, you're doing it wrong. You have to be a connector. Uh, the writer Blake Butler calls his being an open node. If you want to get in, you have to give. If you want to be noticed, you have to notice. Shut up and listen once in a while. Be thoughtful, be considerate, don't turn into a human spam. Be an open mode. You want hearts, not eyeballs. If you want followers, be someone worth following. I think that's a very good advice. Uh, make stuff you'll love and talk about stuff you love. And you'll attract people who love that kind of stuff. Is that simple? Chapter 8. Learn to take a punch. So... Uh, designer Mike Monteiro says that the most valuable skill he picked up in art school was learning how to take a punch. 
he and his fellow classmates were absolutely brutal during critiques. We were basically trying to see if we could get each other to drop out of school. Those vicious critiques taught him uh, not to take criticism personally. When you put out your work out into the world, you have to be ready for the good, the bad, and the ugly. The more people come across your work, the more criticism you'll face. Here's how to take punches. Relax and breathe. Okay, so the trouble with imaginative people is that they're is that we're good at picturing the worst could happen to us. Fear is often just an imagination taking a wrong turn. Bad criticism is not the end of the world. As far as I know, no one has ever died from a bad review. Take a deep breath and accept whatever comes. Uh, next, strengthen your neck. The way to be able to take a punch is to practice getting hit a lot. Uh, next is roll with the punches. Keep moving. Every piece of criticism is an opportunity for new work. You can't control what sort of criticism you receive, but you can control how you react to it. Sometimes when people hate something about your work, it's fun to push that element even further, to make something they hate even more. Having your work hated by certain people is a badge of honor. Next is protect your vulnerable areas. If you have work that is too sensitive or too close to you to be exposed to criticism, keep it hidden. The last one is keep your balance. You have to remember that your work is something you do, not who you are. This is especially hard for artists to accept as so much of what they do is personal. Keep close to your family, friends, and the people you love, people who love you for you, not just the work. Uh, chapter nine, sell out. Even the Renaissance had to be funded. People need to eat and pay the rent. An amateur is an artist who supports himself with outside jobs which enable him to paint, said artist Ben Shan. A professional is someone whose wife works uh, to enable him to paint. When he, whether an artist makes money off his work or not, money has to come from somewhere, be it a day job, wealthy spouse, a trust fund, uh, an arts grant, or a patron. We all have to get over our starving, starving artist romanticism and the idea that touching money inherently corrupts creativity. Some of our most meaningful and most cherished cultural artifacts were made for money. Michelangelo painted the Sistine Chapel ceiling because the Pope commissioned him. Mario Puzo wrote uh, the, the Godfather to make money. He was 45 years old, tired of being an artist, and owed uh, $20,000 to assorted, assorted relatives, banks, bookmakers, and Shylocks. Paul McCartney had said that he and John Lennon used to sit down before a Beatles songwriting session and say, now let's write a swimming pool. So don't be jealous when people uh, you like do well. Celebrate their victory as if it's their own. He talks about how artists should, should make money and it's important that they make money because, you know, in life, uh, we need money to, to survive. Uh, yet, a life of creativity is, uh, is about change. Moving forward, taking chances, exploring new frontiers. The real risk is in not changing, says saxophonist John Coltrane. I have to feel that I'm after something. If I make money, fine, but I'd rather be striving. It's the striving, man. It's that what I want. Be ambitious, keep yourself busy, think bigger, expand your audience. Don't hobble yourself in the name of keeping it real or not selling out. Try new things. If an opportunity comes along that will allow you to do more of the kind of work you want to do, say yes. If an opportunity comes along that would mean more money but less of the kind of work you want to do, say no. And chapter 10, stick around. So don't quit your show. Every career is full of ups and downs. And just like uh, with stories, when you're in the middle of living out your life and career, you don't know what you're, whether you're up whether you're up or down or what's happened, what's about to happen next. If you want the happy ending, actor Orson Welles wrote, that depends, of course, on where, where your story stops. Author uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald wrote, there are no second acts in American life. But if you look around, you'll notice that only, uh, not only are there second acts, there are third, fourth, and even fifth ones. So the people who, who get what, thereafter are very often the ones who just stick around long enough. It's Im very important not to quit prematurely. And uh, what now? He gives three uh, to-do items. So the first one is go online and post what you're working on right now. 
uh, with the work tag, uh, with the hashtag, uh, sh hashtag show your work. Second, uh, plan a show your work night with colleagues or friends. Use this book as a guide, share your work in process and your curiosities, tell stories and teach one another. The third one is to give a copy of this book away to somebody who needs to read it. And that's it. Uh, this book, again, it's short. It's very uh, small and has a lot of like wisdom on how to promote yourself if you are not a uh, self-promoter. And I think the biggest thing that I got from this book is like build your domain and that you have to document your work and show it. And if enough people you know like it, they'll come and talk to you. And I think the, one of the biggest reasons I start this uh, bookcast or booktube is to share or show my work or uh, share my reading list so that hopefully I'll meet people who have similar interest. So if you liked uh, the work or if you liked the book, uh, leave a comment. If you didn't like it, tell me why you didn't like it or the format of this video. I'd be happy or I'd be I'm not happy about taking criticism, but I'd be happy that I'm, I would learn something from you. Well, that's it. And I uh, hope to see you on my next book. Have a great day.